Hey everyone, welcome back to Learn With Me. I'm Deborah Hansen, and today I'm going to go through the key terms for 2.3, Introduction to Memory. So in the other video, I just went through the essential question and all the essential knowledge that the College Board requires us to know for the AP exam. This one is simply the key terms, definition, and real-life example. So hopefully you find these helpful. You can make your flashcards for them, put them in your notebooks, whatever, as long as you're understanding how to basically apply these words when you get the FRQs and when you see them on MCQs, that's really helpful. So if you like my videos, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate that. Leave me comments too to let me know how you like them. And if you have any ideas or suggestions for me to do any other kinds of videos uh, to help you guys with your AP exams. Okay, let's start. So we're basing the key terms on this specific question from the CED. Explain how the types, structures, and processes of memory work. So these are all the words we're going to go through because these are uh, important for this question. So let's start with explicit memory. So explicit memory is the type of long-term memory that involves conscious recall of facts and events. It requires intentional effort to remember and is divided into episodic memory, so your personal experiences, and semantic memory, the general knowledge and facts. So an example, remembering the date of your friend's birthday or recalling the name of the capital of France, Paris, just in case you didn't know, but I'm sure everybody does know because we had the Olympics there this year are both examples of explicit memory as you actively retrieve this information from your memory. Episodic memory. An episodic memory is a type of explicit memory that involves the recollection of specific events, experiences, or episodes from an individual's life. So including the context in which they occurred as such as time and place. So for example, remembering your first day of school, including the details of what you wore, how you felt, what happened that day. This is an example of an episodic memory. It involves recalling a personal experience with rich detail and context. Semantic memory. Semantic memory is a type of explicit memory that involves the recall of general knowledge, facts, and concepts that are not tied to personal experiences. So for example, knowing that the earth orbits the sun or that Paris is the capital of France are examples of semantic memory. This type of memory stores information that is generally known and can be shared with others independent of when or how it was learned. Implicit memory. Implicit memory is a type of long-term memory that occurs without conscious awareness. It involves the unconscious retention of information such as skills, habits, and conditioned responses. So a really good example of that is riding a bicycle after not having done it for so many years. This is an example of implicit memory. Even if you haven't thought about it or consciously practiced the skill, your body remembers how to balance and pedal without you need even needing to think about it. Procedural memory. Procedural memory is a type of implicit memory that involves the unconscious recall of how to perform tasks and actions typically related to motor skills or habits. So for example, typing on a keyboard, a keyboard without looking at the keys is an example of procedural memory. Once you've learned that skill, your fingers automatically know where to go without having to consciously think about each keystroke. Whether you're using your two fingers or you're using both hands, you know where those letters are. That's procedural memory. Perspective memory. Perspective memory is the ability to remember to perform an action or task at a future time. It involves planning and remembering to carry out that intended action. So for example, remembering to take your medicine at 8 p.m. every day is an example of perspective memory. It involves recalling a planned task that needs to be completed in the future. Long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiation, we often you'll see it as LTP, is the process by which synaptic connections between the neurons become stronger with frequent activation. It's considered a key mechanism underlying learning and memory. Remember, we talked about long-term potentiation in unit one when we talked about neurons. So if you frequently study a particular subject, the neural pathways related to that knowledge become stronger, making it easier to recall the information later. So for example, repeatedly practicing a math problem can lead to long-term potentiation, enhancing your ability to solve similar problems more efficiently in the future. You're doing the same thing with your key terms right now. You're going to be remembering them over and over again. The more you practice them, the more you're going to make those connections to those words and on AP day, on exam day, you're going to be able to recall those. Okay, central executive. 
Central executive is a component of working memory that acts as a control system, managing attention, coordinating the activities of other memory systems like phonological loop and visuospatial sketchpad, and integrating that information from different sources. So basically, for example, when you're solving a math problem, while you're ignoring the background noise and remembering the steps you've already completed, the central executive is responsible for directing your attention to the task, managing the information you need and then inhibiting any distractions. Phonological loop. The phonological loop is a component of working memory that deals with temporary storage and manipulation of verbal and auditory information. It allows you to hold and rehearse sounds and words in your mind. So when you mentally repeat a phone number to remember it before dialing, you're using phonological loop. It helps you to keep the sequence of numbers in mind by repeatedly saying them in your head. That would be the phonological loop. Visio spatial sketchpad. So the visio spatial sketchpad is a component of working memory that processes and temporarily stores visual and spatial information. It helps you visualize and manipulate objects in your mind. So when you imagine the layout of your living room while deciding where to place your new for your furniture, you're using visio spatial sketchpad. It allows you to picture the room and mentally arrange the furniture in different configurations. Kind of sounds like a superhero power to me. You no, but anyway, it's not really. Sensory memory. Sensory memory is the briefest form of memory that stores sensory information, like sights, sounds, and smells, for a very short duration, typically less than a second. It acts as a buffer for sensory input and allows the brain to process and decide whether to pay attention to it. So when you see a flash of lightning, the image lingers in your mind for a brief moment, even after you close your eyes. This fleeting visual impression is an example of sensory memory, where the visual information is stored just long enough to be processed by your brain. Iconic memory. Iconic memory is a type of sensory memory that involves the brief retention of visual in images. It allows you to hold an image in your mind for a fraction of a second after the object is no longer in view. So when you glance at a bright image on a screen and then you close your eyes, the brief visual after image you see is an example of iconic memory. This memory allows you to retain a quick snapshot of what you just saw even after the image is gone. Kind of cool, actually. Echoic memory. Echoic memory is a type of sensory memory that involves the brief retention of auditory information. It allows you to remember sounds for a few seconds after they're heard. So when someone asks you a question and you briefly don't respond, then you realize what they said a moment later, you're relying on your echoic memory. This memory lets you hear the question again in your mind, even though the sound already faded. Short-term memory. Short-term memory is the temporary storage system in the brain that holds a small amount of information for a brief period. It's typically around 20 to 30 seconds. It's the information you're actively thinking about and processing. So basically what you're doing right now, you're actively thinking and processing. When someone gives you a phone number and you remember it just long enough to dial it, you're using your short-term memory. This memory helps you keep the number in mind for a few seconds before you either use it or forget it. Now with these, you're going to use the information. You're not going to forget it because you're going to need it on AP day, on AP exam day. Long-term memory. Long-term memory is the part of the memory system responsible for storing information for extended periods. So ranging from hours to a lifetime, it has a vast capacity and includes both explicit conscious and implicit unconscious memories. So remember your first day of school, the capital of your country, how to ride a bike. Those are all examples of long-term memory. These memories are stored in your brain for years and can be recalled whenever you need them. Even what we're doing right now, where we are storing, we are actually learning all of these things. You're storing them. And then, you know, down the road, it'll come up like in a, I always find it comes up like in a quiz night where you remember all these really random things, but it's really important for you to really pay attention to actually store them into your long-term memory so you can use them again in May. 
Structural processing. Structural processing is a shallow level of processing in memory that involves focusing on the physical appearance of structure of information, such as the shape, size, or font of a word, rather than its meaning. So when you remember a word just because it was written in bold or in large distinctive font, but not because of its meaning, you're using structural processing. So for instance, recalling that a particular word in a list was written in all capital letters, but not remembering that the word, what the actual word was. And we do that sometimes like when we're studying in our textbooks, right? And we have these bolded words and we kind of think, oh, wait a second. I remember there was a bolded word there. I don't really remember what it meant. I see it, but I don't remember what it means. That's your structural processing. Phonetic processing is a level of memory that involves focusing on the sound of the words, particularly how they are pronounced rather than their meaning. So it's a deeper level of processing than structural processing, but it's still shallower than the semantic processing. Here's an example. If you're trying to remember the word cat by thinking about how it rhymes with bat, you're using phonetic processing. You're focusing on the sound of the word to help encode it into your memory. Semantic processing. This is all a deep level of memory processing, and it involves focusing on the meaning of the words or information, like we're doing now, rather than just their appearance or sound. This level of processing leads to a better long-term retention of information. So when we're studying the word dog, if you think about the animal it represents, its characteristics, how it relates to other components like pets or loyalty, you're engaging in semantic processing. This deeper understanding makes it more likely that you're going to remember the word and its meaning later on, which is why we do it this way, where I'm giving you the definition, the meaning, but also an example so you can make that semantic processing. You can connect the word to real life examples. Encoding. Encoding is the process of converting information into a form that has been stored in the brain and later retrieved. It's the first step in creating a memory involving the transformation of sensory input into a construct that the brain can store. So for example, when you study for an exam by reading and understanding the material, you're encoding the information into your memory. So for instance, if you learn about the causes of the American Revolution and think about their significance, this information is encoded in your brain for later recall during the exam. Storage. The storage is the process of maintaining and retaining encoded information into the brain. So over time, it can be retrieved and used later. It involves keeping information in short-term or long-term memory. So after learning a new skill, like playing a song on the piano, the information about the notes and the hand movements is stored in your brain. When you play the song again a week later, you're retrieving that stored information so that you can perform the task. Retrieval. Retrieval is the process of accessing and bringing stored information from memory into conscious awareness. It allows you to recall information that has been previously encoded and stored. So when you remember the name of a person you met at a party last week, you're engaging in retrieval. The process involves accessing that stored memory of their name, bringing it into your conscious mind so that now you can use it in conversation. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go through each word and I want you to pause the video and try to see if you can remember what the meaning of it is. And if you can remember like that semantic processing, if you can remember a connection as to a real life example of what that means, this will help you when you write your AP exams and you can actually apply these words into your FRQs and also when you see them in your FCQs. Okay, explicit memory. Episodic memory. Semantic memory. Implicit memory. Prospective memory. Long-term potentiation. Central executive. Phonological loop. Visio spatial sketchpad. Sensory memory. Iconic memory. Echoic memory. Short term memory. 
long-term memory. Structural processing. Phonetic processing. Oh, sorry, phonemic processing. Sorry. Semantic processing. Encoding. Storage. I believe this is the last one. Retrieval. Okay, so those are all the key terms for 2.3, introduction to memory. So hopefully you found this helpful. I know there's lots of ways to do this, to remember them. There's lots of quizlets and there's lots of things online that you can do. I really like the idea of writing them on flashcards and I get my students to do that so that you can remember them, you can flip through them. The ones with the little spirals on them are really great because they keep them all in one place. Um, I think it's really helpful to know, to understand the definition and how it applies. This is really gonna help you on, on exam day, okay? Hope you really liked the video and I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. I'm trying to get to 10,000. I know it's a long job, but hey, why not? Um, and if you want to leave me a comment, that's also great. I always answer all my comments and I look forward to seeing um, how you guys are using the videos and if you appreciate them or if you actually find them useful, that's really helpful to me. So as always, have a great day. See you next time.